Father, we thank you for this eighth session. And I ask you for impartation. Lord, we're longing for impartation in the name of Jesus. And we ask you to release it. Amen. Again, we're in the eighth session tonight and tomorrow night. The ninth session, and in both of these two evenings, I want to highlight different uh, prophetic testimonies related uh, in, in a very, some really dramatic ways related to God's promise to release healing, greater works than these. Now, I've looked over all the uh, lists and of all the stories that we've told over the years and the testimonies, and, and right now, I'm sure I'm missing a couple, but uh, I have 17, 17 supernatural events that are very unusual where the Lord is emphasizing that signs and wonders and miracles, and a number of them uh, would have an emphasis beyond the book of Acts is going to happen across the earth and, uh, and in a real personal way here in Kansas City as well. Not only here in Kansas City, it's what is on his agenda for the earth. And so I have 17 different stories, and I'm not going to uh, tell them all in depth, but I'm going to uh, tell uh, three of them tonight. And hopefully, hopefully, and uh, four of them tomorrow night. And then I'm just going to make a brief reference to the other ten. And so that's my uh, purpose uh, to, to cover. Now, again, uh, prophetic, uh, prophetic ministry. This is a, uh, uh, an interesting thing, the prophetic ministry. You're in Joel chapter 2. And what I mean by that... <laughs> is that I've taken a step back. I like to do this sometimes. And I ask God why he runs his kingdom the way he runs it and why he invented things in the way he invented them, like fasting. Like, okay, which one of the three of you came up with fasting? Okay, I'm talking to the Godhead. Who invented fasting? I just would like to know how that works. And, and I'm sure I never will, but... The prophetic ministry is a strange thing. And what I mean by that, in uh, Numbers chapter 12, I'm just going to quote a bunch of verses to you. I'll tell you which ones to turn to. Of course, you can turn to any ones you want, but I'm only going to be there for a, so a moment. Numbers 12, verse 6 to 8, the Lord appears to Moses. The Lord appears to him and says, Moses, uh, when I speak to a prophet, I speak in dreams visions and riddles, and one translation says parables. God says, I invented the prophetic ministry, and when I release it, I give it in parables. I give it in dark sayings. Very rarely do I speak face to face. I, I have chosen as the God, I was going to say the God of color and music. I have chosen as the, the God of wisdom to speak through prophetic poetry. Now, he's telling this to Moses. I speak in dark sayings. However, he says, when I talk to you, Moses, it's mostly face-to-face. -face, but when I talk to the rest of my servants through history, it's through parables, mostly. Now, that, again, you, you take a step back and you go, Lord, why did you do that? Then Jesus comes, Matthew 13. He says, I came to speak in parables. Undoubtedly, the same person that's speaking to Moses back in Numbers 12 and Jesus t gives us the reason why he speaks in parables. He speaks in parables to make truth difficult, and he speaks in parables to make truth easy. He, he has two extreme reasons for parables. In Matthew 13, he highlighted the negative reason. He goes, I speak in parables and tricky sayings so that the intelligent that aren't spiritually hungry don't get it. I don't want them to get it. I don't want them to get it by virtue of superior intellect. I want them to get it by virtue of spiritual hunger. And he, yeah, it's a little bit of what we highlighted last night when Jesus offends the mind to reveal the heart. I mean, here he is just on purpose saying it confusing. And he has all the security and dignity of being God. He's not troubled that everybody thinks his style's off. It doesn't, doesn't bother him at all. He just says, that's just how I'm going to run things for a long time. And he's God. Then he gets his, his, uh, his uh, disciples aside. Now you think he's going to tell them everything. Now he, he gives them some of the secrets. But then even then he tells them parables. 
So even the, the very, uh, the most anointed, he still is in this parable mode. Now, it's an odd thing to people that God still speaks in prophetic parables. We assume that somewhere God changed. He didn't. The God that told that to Moses and the God that told it to the nation of Israel in Matthew 13, Jesus, is still the same God and he still talks the exact same way because he wants to make truth hard and he wants to make truth simple and he has all kinds of steps in between because he wants to base the reception of truth on hunger, not on superior intellect because what I mentioned the other night about eschatology or end times. The Bible was written, when God had the Bible written, you know who he had in mind? He had in mind the vast majority of the human beings in history which are in third world countries and illiterate. God did not have in mind mostly the top seven seminaries in America. God had mostly in mind illiterate peasants all through human history, he says, I'm going to make my truth so easy, an illiterate person up in a mountain village in a third world country can understand exactly what I'm saying if they have spiritual hunger. And I'm going to present my truth in such a way where the most brilliant intellect, if they don't have spiritual hunger, cannot make any sense of my simple word that the peasants of the earth understand. Now the Lord, again, it's a strange thing. It's a it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mysterious but masterful thing. We have this combination of the written word and we have the combination of the moving, flowing Holy Spirit revelation. So the Lord says, I'm going to give you the written word. That's your primary, that is your authority. But I'm not stopping the parable, Holy Spirit parable thing because I've given a written word. Because I've given the written word, I haven't changed my personality or my strategy. I'm going to continue to base everything on the written word, but I'm going to, at the, especially in the last days, uh, Joel 2.28, Acts 2.17, he's going to flood the atmosphere of the kingdom of God with dreams and visions and parables. And those parables will honor the written word. Those parables mixed with the written word with a heart of wholeheartedness with fasting and prayer is going to unlock faith second to no time in history. Let me say that again. Acts 2.17 or Joel 2.28, it's the same, whichever one you want. He's going to give all of the redeemed dream, dreams and visions. Imagine this. Imagine this. Imagine this. One billion people on the planet getting spiritual dreams and visions. Unthinkable. Think of this. Houses of prayer all over the planet with fasting teams in every region of the earth going, covering, every, covering every day of the year. Fasting, prayer. Dreams, visions, now go to the other deal. Martyrdom, righteous blood being shed. Go to the other uh, point. The host of the wickedness is mounting up to charge and the zeal of God is kindled. Beloved, how could you, how would you describe the anatomy, if you would, of the atmosphere of the earth in the final hours of natural history. What will the spiritual atmosphere be like when there's a billion people, when God has flooded the kingdom of God with dreams and visions, prophetic anointing, fasting of prayers everywhere, houses of prayers everywhere, martyrdom and righteous blood is shed, Satan's mounting up, God's zeal for the harvest, it's colliding in, a, in, a, in the period of a decade or two. I, let me tell you this, it's going to feel different than it feels right now. People have this idea it's going to go on business as usual like there's no martyrs, no billion people with dreams and visions, no prayer movement, no rising up of wickedness becoming ripe to where God harvests, harvests wickedness in the earth. They're imagining it like it is now. It's not. The atmosphere is going to be very dynamic. And God always the written word will be our primary authority. But God is going to take the written word, the fasting and prayer wholehearted, love sick, a believer in intimacy, throw in the prophetic unction of parables, let those mix together in an atmosphere like I've just described, and I tell you the church is going to come to fullness, fullness of faith in that atmosphere. So we're not emphasizing, I am not wanting in any way to emphasize the prophetic parable nature of the kingdom of God any in any way over the written word. The written word we honor. 
Anything that contradicts one sentence of the written word is out. But at the same time, I want to bow before the sovereign king that says, when I speak to a prophet, I speak in parables. And in the last days, all of my servants, all of them, handmaidens and bond servants, will have dreams and visions. I'm bowing down to that and say, you're the king. I'm the little guy. You're the big guy. You're setting it up. We're going for it. We're not backing away from it. And the strangeness of the prophetic is, is, uh, is uh, calculated calculated by the wisest man that's ever lived on the earth, Jesus, to offend people who don't have a hungry heart. Those in the side of the church and those outside of the church. Many people in the church have intellectual knowledge but don't have a passionate, hungry heart, and they will be as offended as some outside the church that aren't even born again. And we're not going to take our cues from who's mad, glad, and sad. We're taking our cues from the written word of God, and it's happening. The reason I'm saying that is that uh, uh, I'm sharing these testimonies for a number of reasons. W one reason is because I want to uh, inspire, I want in, uh, uh, impartation, uh, impartation. But at the same time, I want the information going out because I want there to be a new paradigm of, the, of a radical commitment to the Word, a radical commitment to fasting and prayer, and a radical commitment to the realm of the Holy Spirit that exalts Jesus. A radical commitment to this realm. Not put our toe in the water and maintain our respectability. A radical commitment to all of these things. That's where we're going. And we're going to take these uh, 12 testimonies and we're going to put them on the website. We're going to make them real affordable. We're going to put, I'm going to put it in book form right away. And, it, and the Lord has spoken so clearly to me, Isaiah 40 verse 9, get up on the mountain. It's time to shout it and let the chips fall where they fall. That's where we're going with this. So, so, well, just make, clap. I love it. Make sure your seatbelt's on because we're in this thing together. Because well, whatever happens, good and bad, doesn't stop with me. Who's ever got their seatbelt on is going to be okay. But those that aren't might slide right into something else. Because it's going to get shaky, I'm telling you. I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, the, I think the group that will be the most adversarial at first will be people in the kingdom of God because uh, the statement is made, not purposefully, it's just anybody doing the math in anywhere can do it. The statement is made, if this is the right way, I mentioned it last night, oh, then you're saying we're doing it the wrong way. No, we're not even talking about you. Oh, but you are. You're saying that this is the wrong way we're doing it. It's the inevitable comparisons that cannot be stopped if you take a stand. And then all of the, I mean, those things will hit little junior high Bible studies. Those things will hit the Bible study in the old folks' home. Those little scenarios will hit everywhere. And then it just, it's kind of, there's a few hiccups for a while. And at the end of the day, the, the adversarial uh, uh, dimension will be completely uh, uh, erased and healed and unified. And then uh, it will be the world in the real adversarial role, capital A, because the other one's is small a. It, but there's trouble while we're transitioning, transitioning, because there's a new paradigm of the kingdom. But, but again, uh, in these sessions, my goal is to have you receive impartation tonight. But, but I want the information so you can check in it later. And understand, like, well, what was that one story? But more than just the stories, I, I'm wanting to establish a paradigm of the kingdom that has this dimension in it and not in any way draw back from it at all. And so because this stuff, I, I remember I mentioned last night how confused I was when I first met Bob and Augustine and some of the others. It was, again, it was kind of cute to be confused back then because it was like, oh, gee, I don't get it. Nobody gets it. But it's 20 years later. And the Lord says, you know, I've raised up a number of, of prophets around the land, and, you know, let's, let's move on. It, it was cute to be all confused and perplexed, and everybody's unbelieving, and, every, and that's okay for a while, but let's move on and be men and women of maturity. Let's be seasoned in the Spirit. Let's get the job done now and get past the realm where everything is so new and so confusing all the time. My point being, we need servants of God all over the world to start laying it out with biblical responsibility, but boldly, so we say what happened, so that others all over the earth begin to say, well, this is happening to me, this is right, so we don't stay in this spiritual infancy in the Holy Spirit realm forever, while the occult realm is growing and prosper, I mean, not growing and prospering, increasing in their experience and in their evil seasoning in the things of darkness. We have to be seasoned in the things of the Holy Spirit. 
I don't mean a thousand, I mean like a hundred million worldwide. It's time to start speaking clearly and uh, not worry so much about the parabolic dimension of our king. He is our king. He loves parables. He is a poet. That's how it is. That's how it will always be. And I'm going with him. I'm going to the dance of the dance at the end of the age with that king. And I'm going to dance the dance with him. And lots of people are worshiping that king. They're born again. But they don't like that part of the king. And we're just going to move on. And we're going to go for it. Okay, so that's, I'm just giving you the little tip-offs. That's why these, these, this 12-week uh, thing is so important. Okay, now, Joel chapter 2. Here we are, verse 15. Fast and pray. Okay, verse 28. Afterwards, I'll pour out my Spirit on all flesh. There's dreams and visions, but how many of you know the pouring out of the Spirit this is all of the world because here, make it clear, make it clear. The afterwards is relating to the fasting and prayer dimension partially. It's related to some others. I'm on Joel here on Saturday nights uh, 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 the way it is right now. We're right on Joel 2. But in verse 31, it's, it's after some of the things in Joel 2, but it's before the second coming this happens. It's before the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's before the appearing of Jesus in the sky that the outpouring on all nations takes place. Now, when the Lord pours it out, he is going to have a, a totally different atmosphere across the earth. There are going to be par uh, prophetic parables everywhere, and we do have to use wisdom and government, and it has to honor the word. All that kind of, those things are very, very important. But in this is going to be healing. Healing is very, very, very important. The kingdom will not be accomplished without signs and wonders, let me say this strongly, significantly beyond what happened in the book of Acts significantly beyond in scope and measure and even, even the, the uh, what's the word? I don't mean just many more people, of course, because the world was small then and it's big population-wise, but uh, the magnitude of it is going to go, be, go beyond the book of Acts. Look at this, verse 30, it's going to touch the atmosphere in many, many kinds of ways. The atmosphere is going to respond to the prophetic dreams and visions that God gives. God's going to cause signs and wonders, blood, fire, and smoke are going to be part of the package of the end time prophetic church. I mean, we think when fire and wine is heavy, wait till blood, fire, and smoke start appearing. I'm serious. These are really going to appear. These are not, this is not poetic. This is literal. Oh, the atmosphere of the planet is going to be so absolutely different than it is right now. Well, when the Lord pours out his spirit in Isaiah 61, he called it healing. When he pours out his spirit here in Joel 2, he calls it prophecy. When the spirit's poured out its healing, its prophecy, it opens up the winds, the, the whole realm of the wind of God, the winds of the spirit. So we know the famous verse, uh, uh, Luke 4.18, 4, where J Jesus is quoting Isaiah 61, when the Spirit of the Lord God's upon me, I'm going to open blind eyes, etc., etc. So we know the uh, Luke 4.18 is talking about this outpouring here in Joel 2.28. It's the same outpouring in, in Luke 4.18. It releases healing. Here it releases prophecy. It's the same kind of deal. It's the same kind of thing. It's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> John uh, uh, 14, 12. We know it. Jesus said, greater works than these will they do. Then I'm going to get right to the stories. Greater works than these till we do. Let me tell you this. Very soberly, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, greater works than these. Speaking of his own works, his own miracles, he goes, whatever miracles I did, serious miracles. Incidentally, the book of Acts did not enter into the measure of miracles Jesus walked in. They touched one here, one there, nowhere close. Jesus walked on the water in Acts, uh, 9, uh, Acts 27, 28, whatever, Acts 27, Paul was swimming and dog paddling in the water. Jesus walked on it and commanded the storm. Paul was in the dog paddling for three days in the middle of the storm. He didn't walk in the same authority Jesus did. The Son of God said, truly, truly, this will happen. Let me tell you something soberly. It has not happened. It has not happened. And, and I've seen smart guys try to make it this and that. I go, oh, come on, you guys. He said what he meant. He meant what he said. It's going to happen. It hasn't happened. A peasant on a, on a poor village in a mountaintop can figure this out. 
And of course, that's the wisdom of God. That's, the Lord, that's what the Lord's point is. Yes, that's the point. It's easy to figure out. Unless you're really top-heavy. If you're really top-heavy, you're going to miss it. Your heart's going to be, uh, uh, what's the word, just absolutely suffocated with your, uh, not yours, but with the feeling of superior intellect. The heart is suffocated, and revelation is minimized dynamically. I love studying the Word. I'm a student of the Word. But I want my heart with the Holy Spirit to be the master and I want my uh, feeling of grasping such great things to be second to the Holy Spirit's leadership in my life. And that's hard to do because it's easy to rise up and inside and just be so pleased with how smart we are. Okay, John 14, 12. I'm going to give a, a, I'm going to mention, I'm going to mention 10 of these prophetic promises for healing, mention them just like for a line or two, so that you can go back and, and uh, have them all together uh, on the tape here. Number one, I mentioned it, Howard Pittman. Remember, in November 15th, when I had that experience where Bob Jones said, you're going to have a revelation from heaven on November 15th, Howard Pittman, and some of you can't remember all these names and dates right now, but I'm only saying it so we could review the tape and go, oh, yeah, I, I, it's clear now, because right now it's just too much information. In August 79, Howard Pittman, the policeman from Louisiana, dies, has the heavenly experience. He stands before the throne. The voice of God says, my servants in the last day, I mean, uh, my son is returning, something like that. I don't have the exact language of it right now. But uh, they will do greater works than these. The Lord, the Father from heaven, quoted John 14, 12. And he was a Baptist pastor, and he said, Lord, I don't believe this. That's what he said in his heart. And the Lord said, you're greatly mistaken. He said, my servants will do miracles even greater than Elijah. Number one. Number two, Bob Jones, when he had his angelic visitation, the famous, I mean, the important one, not the famous one, the important one in his life that established him, August 8, 1975, he sees the two angels in his death experience, and they said, they're going to do greater works than these. They're going to move in realms of power unseen in history type deal. That's not an exact quotation, but realms of power uh, that have at a level never before manifest, something like that. Number three, Paul Cain has the open vision. He has a hundred times, he says. And again, that's, that's not an actual number, but many, many times over 25 years. In the stadiums, and the uh, announcers come in, and they say uh, they're going three days and three nights without food or, or water or change of clothing, and 100,000 are, are in, and 100,000 on the outside, and miracles, the lame are walked, the limbs are growing out, the dead are being raised. And Paul saw this, he said, near 100 times. So that's three right there. Last night, I gave two more. I talked about the uh, healing procession down Blue Ridge Road. As Bob Jones was, uh, saw that procession where he, uh, the Lord called him Mephibosheth, and he had the white garments. He's in a, in a hospital gown. And we were in Overland Park, and the Lord says, you're going to move over to, to by the Blue Ridge, by where Harrius Truman is. And you're going to walk, to, you're going to have a procession to Arrowhead Stadium because of all the healings and all the people getting healed are in the streets and, and the city. Many, many people in the city. Many don't show up, but many show up. And it's a, it's a procession from here, what, 10 miles, whatever it is, to Arrowhead Stadium, uh, uh, Truman Sports Complex, and the miracles are being paraded before the city. And the angel of the Lord told Bob, this is literal, and about five, four or five literal things happened in the future Bob said four or five things would happen that were several years out, and every one of them happened precisely as he said, and they were several years ahead of time, situations he had no control over. The miracles are going to happen, and it's going to be paraded on the way to Arrowhead Stadium. The heavenly experience I talked about last night, uh, the, the, the one, and, and I'm not saying one to minimize it, I, I want 20 of them, I want a bunch of them, I only have one in 30 years, but I want... That's not okay with me. I want more. There's a new realm. God's going to be interfacing with angels and people caught up to the throne. It's going to happen. I don't mean it's going to be commonplace, but it's going to not going to be one out of this large number. It's going to be much more commonplace, though never commonplace in the sense where people are having these experiences. But I'm there, and the Lord shows me he's going to release end-time apostles all around the earth, and he's going to release them out of Kansas City, uh, at least 30, 40, 50. I didn't, you know, I saw the, the list, 30 to 50. I don't know the real number, but they're going to happen all over. And believe, beloved, 
apostles do miracles beyond the book of Acts, the end time apostles do. That was a promise of healing. Beloved, I'm talking about real apostles, real ones that have an anointing. They're not going to write the word of God like the apostles of the Lamb in the, in the first century, but they will have an authority in the spirit before the end time drama that will surpass in terms of power of signs and wonders, surpass even the book of Acts. And God is in the business of raising up apostles all over the earth, male and female, old and young, and they're going to do miracles. So that's, uh, last night I gave those two examples. So that's uh, uh, the three I gave you, Howard Pittman, Bob Jones, Paul Kane, And then the two last night, that's five of them. And then three of them, I'm only going to say the title of them, and I'm going to reference them in context to other stories on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. I'm not going to reference them. I'm not going to talk about them as healing testimonies, but they have healing in them, but I just want to reference them so when you hear those and you get familiar with them, you'll say, now, what were those 17 healing ones again? There's one in September 1984, which I will talk about. Just say it this way. You'll remember it after I, I tell you on Thursday. The white horse and the black horse in conflict. And that's the, one of the most dramatic experiences I've had, second only to the heavenly visitation I told you last night. So the white and the black horse in collision in September 84. You don't even know what that means, but, that's, but uh, when you go back and hear this, you will. The next one about the blueprint prophecy, you'll hear about that, signs and wonders. And the next one, I'm going to uh, reference a little bit about our sovereign connection with John Wimber in the vineyard. And the Lord says, I want you to enter into the compassion and worship mantle. I want you to partake of it for signs and wonders. And there was a lot about that because he said, I want you guys to mix prophetic and intercession with compassion and worship. And you don't know about that story. I mean, a few of you do, but most of you don't. But those are three stories that uh, make uh, the list I've just given you ten. Now we're going to go on to some new ones tonight for a few minutes, and uh, just uh, three tonight if I have time, and then four tomorrow night. Uh, turn to Luke chapter 4, verse 18. I just quoted it, but let's just look at it. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. This has to do with Paul Cain's mother, Anna Cain. She dies at age 105. Here it is, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That sounds like Joel 2, 28. But this time, it's to heal. In Joel 2, 28, the Spirit of God was being poured out for prophesying. It's both and, not either or. Look at what Jesus says in Luke 4, 18. He goes, the Father, in essence, has sent me to heal. He sent me to heal. Now, this runs parallel with what John the Apostle said in 1 John 3, 8. He says, the Son of God was manifest to destroy the works of darkness. It's the same thing. Here he was sent to heal. 1 John 3, 8, he was sent to destroy. Beloved, Jesus came at the first coming all through church history. It is going to crescendo in the, in the generation when the whole spiritual atmosphere is different in the earth with good and evil being increased. The light gets lighter, the dark gets darker. The Son of God is going to manifest His rage against the works of darkness and He has come, it says 1 John 3, 8, to destroy to destroy the works of darkness. He has vengeance about it. Here he says at the, the positive side, I'm going to heal. There he says, I'm going to destroy. He's talking about the same, uh, the same uh, uh, heartbeat in, in the heart of Jesus Christ. Okay, now, I, I don't want to give the Paul Cain story because I gave it a, a five or ten minute overview on, I think, the first or second night. And you can, we have uh, tapes on his whole story and, and we need to have him come and say it all again. But uh, what happened is that uh, most of you know that well, his mother was 45 years old. She had the three terminal diseases when she was 45. She had a, a, a five miscarriages in a row. She's pregnant. She's 45 years old. The Lord promised her a son. She hasn't had a son. The angel of the Lord appears to her. 1929, she's instantly healed of the three terminal diseases. She has the son. The angel of the Lord says, name him Paul, and, the, and, and part of his purpose, that he even told uh, his mother and told Paul later, that he, he would see the beginning of the end time move of God all over the earth. He might see it to the end, who knows, but he will at least see the beginning, which has not uh, uh, happened in the kind of beginning that we call a beginning. I believe that the uh, 10 years after 1984 to 1994, with the outpouring of wine, is a true beginning. But, but when we talk about Paul witnessing the beginning, 
Uh, we're talking about even more than this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, be beginning of the beginning. How's that? Because I believe uh, uh, in, March, in, in March and April 1994, uh, the Lord spoke audibly and said, in 10 years it begins. And we think, I believe, Bob believes, it's talking not about Kansas City. It's talking about a, a calendar that God is operating on globally that the wine is the first introduction of a whole generation of strategic unfoldings across the earth. And that was the topic last night. I don't want to go back there again. But anyway, Paul will see the beginning. And it's more than just the wine beginning. It's the stadiums coming together is what we're believing it to be. So the angel of the Lord heals Paul's mom when she's uh, 45. She is so healed, she goes on for 60 more years. She has perfect eyesight in her 90s. Perfect eyesight. Never has gone to a doctor once. After that, until she was nearly 100 or 95 to 100, somewhere in there. Perfect health. I mean, divine health. Perfect health. Amazing. Everything was made new. She didn't have cavities. She didn't have this. She didn't have that. She didn't have the other. Uh, uh, one person said, I don't know that for a fact. I've never heard Paul say that, but there's many family friends that tell her stories. I don't, you know, I, I never checked with the dentist, but she never went, so there would be no dentist to check with. It just occurred to me. Okay. Okay, she's 105. Now, Paul's mom was a prophetess, and she, she would have meetings. Like, she would uh, pray for Paul. She was, a, she was an Anna. Her name's Anna. She was an Anna in the temple. She was an Anna. She was an intercessor her whole, her whole life, a woman of intense fasting and prayer in the prophetic anointing. And she said, Paul, tonight there's going to be a lady in blue. I had an open vision on the second row. He says, make sure you call her out. She has tuberculosis. And he would get there. The lady would be in blue and uh, whatever color it was. And this, he said this happened so many times, he'd call her out on his mom's word. He says, I didn't even have the word for that lady. And the lady had the disease, and, and she would be touched. He goes, that happened so many times. I, he goes, I couldn't even tell all the stories. It would take too long. So his mother tells him, before she goes into a coma, a coma the last two or three months. But the mother tells him, when she's 105, Paul, 104, right there at the end, uh, I'm going to have one more word, and the Lord's going to speak to you in my death. It's a very, very important word. The, I've given you words your whole life, but the Lord wants to speak one more time in my death to you. And so she went in this coma. So Paul was really stirred up because he was thinking the devil was getting in and the mom wasn't going to give him the word. And she said, this will be the most important word I've ever given you. And so he's going, well, give it to me now, mom. She goes, well, I don't have it now, but the Lord promised me I would. He says, well, can't you kind of like get it just in case? And if this is the most important word you're ever going to give me, is there any way you could, you know, like throw in that one extra day of fasting or prayer or something? Or, no, I'm, I'm just joking around. He never said that. But he was, he was anxious about it, he, admittedly. So she went in the coma for two months. He's really anxious. I mean, uh, he's got Jack Deere in Anaheim Vineyard and the big five, 7,000 member church. And they're praying. They're having prayer meetings that God would awaken her and she'd give the word. We had prayer. I mean, not special prayer meetings just for that. But in the prayer meetings, we hit it. A lot of them, and because Paul says she could die any day. This is, I haven't even begun to enter my, in, my ministry, and this is the most important word I'll ever receive from a person besides the Lord himself. And so uh, it, it's looking bad. And I said, well, you know, if, if the Lord said it, I mean, because, yeah, but the, the devil wins some of these. And so I remember the day Paul uh, called me on the phone in Kansas City. He's in Dallas, and she's in Dallas. And he says, Mike. I think she's dying today. I said, why today? He goes, I, I can't say that I know that I know, but I think I know today. I, I, I want you to come and, and be with me. So I got on the plane, you know, because she's been in the coma for two months. And, you know, you don't, you, a plane Monday, get another ticket Tuesday. Get, you know, you're kind of wondering how this is going to work. You, so I just went. And she died and, and got there that night. And the next day she died. And we're at, we're at the bed side. And she is... Uh, she is uh, in the coma. I'm not here when this happens, because this happens at night. I get there that night, but I'm asleep, but Paul's there all night with her. She wakes up out of the coma, and she says, Paul, the Lord is going to speak. He's going to release over your life and over the body of Christ across the world, Luke 4, 18. She wakes up, says it, and goes right back into the coma. She just said it of sound mind. He's going to, in your life and in the body of Christ across the whole world, Luke 4, 18. So Paul's... Uh, he doesn't even care about that at that moment. He's so grieved about his mom. So now the next morning, he uh, 
tells me, he goes, I got the word last night, but, you know, it doesn't mean anything to me right now. I, I love my mother so much, she's, she's going to die today for sure. And so I'm sitting there at, at, at the bed, and she dies. I, I watch her do that, and that was it. And she had all the, the machine on, and the thing, you know, went, eh, you know, it's over. And I'm just staring, and Paul is sobbing, and I'm just staring straight, straight ahead. And I'm looking straight at the digital clock. You know, I'm not l thinking of looking at it. I'm just thinking, oh, man, because the clock was right there because they had to have a digital clock because of certain Medicare, I mean, medications and certain things that you had to time to the minute. And uh, I was just staring at it. And so the uh, guys come in, and, uh, you know, the official guys, and they say, uh, what time did she die? I said, well, she died at 418. She died at 418. And uh, I don't think anything about it. I go uh, over to Anaheim, and all the people in Anaheim, a lot of them are praying. Um, this is like a month or two later. I, I don't ever think anything about it. And they said, hey, uh, whatever happened to Paul's uh, mother? Did she ever give uh, the, uh, the prophecy? I said, yeah, it was Luke 418. They said, wow, that's great. And then one guy says, well, what time was it, early or late, that she died? I said, well, she died at 418. <laughs> and, and then the other guy speaks up and says, what was the date? I said, April 18, 418. Oh, my goodness. And it hit me. 418. She woke up out of a coma and said, four, a coma and said 418. She died exactly at 418 on 418. And the Lord spoke to her and said, Paul, I'm going to give you the most prophetic word I've ever given you, the most important one. And even in my death, God will speak prophetically, even in my death. Listen carefully. I did not get it for two months. Paul Cain did not get it for two months. This little group of ladies asking me the questions about the funeral in Anaheim who were praying, they pieced it all together. And I went, unbelievable. I said, Paul, Paul, this is the message. 418, 418, 418. Now, you go try to pick the day you die, and if you want to get more specific, pick the minute you die on that day, and then I will call this thing a coincidence. <laughs> but you got to die first, and you got to tell me the day and the minute before I call this thing any less than a sign and a wonder of a woman coming out of an, a, a coma speaking the verse and then dying exactly lined up that way. And the message was for Paul, but the message was for the body of Christ worldwide. Beloved, we're going to enter into Luke 4.18. I promise you, what Jesus introduced at the first coming, when the atmosphere of a billion people and fasting and prayer and signs and wonders, prophetic anointing across the earth, and the zeal of God, I'm telling you, Luke 4.18 is going to enter in a whole other dimension of the body of Christ. Okay, second one, turn to Habakkuk if you will. Habakkuk. Where is Habakkuk? It's number five to the end of the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter four. No, no. Uh, uh, it's the fifth book to the end of the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter three, verse four. Habakkuk chapter three, verse four. So August 1982. Bob Jones is sitting on his, he said, I'm sitting there at noon in the, in the hot sun, and the Lord visits him. This is one of the most, uh, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's had about 10, what he would call his most significant visitations, and of course, any time the Lord speaks, it's significant, but 10 of them where there's a grandeur, there's a manifestation of power that attends the visitation, and uh, the Lord visits him, and I won't go into the description, that's not the important part, but he's having a a direct encounter where the Lord's talking and he, listens, he hears his voice. And the Lord says this to him in August 1982, because remember, uh, the, uh, uh, we connected in the March of 83, and the Lord was telling him, and he'd been telling, uh, he'd been telling the church he'd been at for three years that in the, that in, in the spring of 1983, a group of young people were going to come Talking on intercession and revival, I mentioned that to you. And when I met his pastor, he had a couple, two pastors in the church, one of them. The man told me, he goes, yeah, Bob told us that, that in 80, 1983, he's told us all that there was going to be a young man, 27 years old, coming, talking on intercession and revival. He goes, and he said he would leave when that happened. And so this is in uh, August 82. It's nine months from that. 
And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be tempted to tone the story down, but that's just what the, the pastor told me, and that's what Bob said, and I'm just going for it. Because uh, uh, I'm going to stand bold in that. I'm going to have to answer for the judgment seat, so I might as well be bold on this side and get the job done. So uh, the Lord visits him and talks to him about this youth army. So there's an army coming. There's an army coming in this city. Of course, he knew that from the angelic visitation of August 75, that there was an army coming. He says, I'm going to release a little bit of power in their hands. He said this, this phrase to him. I'm going to release a little bit of power in their hands. A little power. Now, little, you say, I thought it was going to be beyond the book of Acts. We, we're talking relative to the God who did Genesis 1, okay? I, I, I'm sure it would be unusual for Jesus to say, I'm going to release stunning power. And then the angels look at Jesus and go, did you sim a little overstate that? And he goes, well, maybe I, you know, I did Genesis 1 and everything else. So it's called a little power. That's what he tells him. And Bob says it's, 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 uh, it's the kind of vision that, that we're thinking of, of the, in, of the church in the last days, at the end times. I mean, it's been the last days since the day of Pentecost, but we're at the last of the last days, and that's what we refer to as the end times. The Lord says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to descend upon them in glory as light. I'm going to descend upon them in glory, and it's going to be like light. They're, now, not just this group in Kansas City. He cared about the group in Kansas City, but this is a dynamic God will be doing across the earth. When we gather in the stadiums, and not just the stadiums, even in just Holy Spirit gatherings, there will be times when the Shekinah glory of God will break in like it did with Solomon in 2 Chronicles 5, 6, and 7. The Shekinah glory will break in, and it will be like bright light. And everybody, well, I don't know about everybody, but, but many, many will see the bright light is the idea. The Shekinah glory will break in. And he says, I'm going to descend upon them in bright light. And Bob understood it like the Mount of Transfiguration that Peter, James, and John saw. I don't know that the Lord told him that. I don't know that. But Bob would sometimes reference the brightness of the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, but here's the interesting thing that Bob said. He goes, when my light is on them, when they raise their hand up. He says, when they raise their hand up, the people getting healed, not all of them, not every time, the people getting healed will see literal white light come out of their hands. Because the Lord wants the people getting healed to connect it with the message of the messenger speaking. Because many of them will be unbelievers. And I asked Bob, believers, unbelievers? He said, uh, both and, but... But it's, it's more for the sake of the harvest, but it, he says that undoubtedly it will happen. Some believers will see it. He goes, he goes, when they raise their hands, and he goes, I see them in these stadiums, just like Paul Cain. He goes, when they raise their hands, and the Shekinah of glory won't always be manifest to everybody. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. And even when it's not manifest to everybody, when they get into the spirit of power, where the, pre, the like Luke 6, the present, the, 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 what's it called, the, Presence of the Lord is present to heal, or the power of the Lord is present to heal, is what I'm trying to say. There will be moments where the power of the Lord will be present to heal, and they will stretch out their hand, and the, and the, the sick person will see the light, the Shekinah glory. He said, I don't even know that the person doing the prayer will see it, but the person receiving it, and again, it won't happen every time. It'll happen here and there, but it will happen, the Shekinah glory, and they will connect the healing power that drives cancer out of their body in one sentence, they will connect it with the message that is being spoken by the messenger that's praying for them. And he said, and, and the Lord spoke to him. He said, this, and I don't have this exactly right, but I'll just describe it instead of trying to quote it. Habakkuk 3.4 is describing Jesus. This is Jesus. His brightness was like that of light. He had rays flashing from his hands. And there is the key word, New King James. There, it may not be in every translation, there his power was hidden. His power was hidden in his hands. And the Lord would go forth in brightness. And when the Lord would raise his hand, rays would flash from his hands, because that's where the power of God is being, uh, I, don't, I don't know if these are the exact words, I mean, if these are accurate words, they're, uh, 
not uh, in reserve because the Holy Spirit's not in reserve. But the, the place where the power's coming from, it's not being stored up in their hands. That's not a biblical idea. It's the Holy Spirit's eternal. But it's poetic language. The power is coming from the hands, and the people, uh, the people see it. And what the Lord tells Bob, he says, this youth army that I'm raising up, and this is an exact language, but he says, this army I'm raising up in Kansas City. He tells, me, he tells him specifically in Kansas City. Again, this is going to happen all over Asia, everywhere, and other places. He says, I will release Habakkuk 3.4, which is an anointing but that belongs to Jesus, but it's the greater works than these, and this is going to be part of the works of Jesus happening in the lives of the redeemed. And I believe it. There was no uh, supernatural confirm confirmation of that. That's one of the few stories I'm giving you where there was not a confirmation. But I love that story. I know it's true. That's part of the greater works than these. But that was a, of, uh, uh, because uh, Bob's track record with me has uh, been so accurate over the years. And he said, Mike, this is one of the most uh, powerful visitations I've ever had in my life. Okay. We have about uh, eight or ten more minutes, and we've got one more story, and then we're going to be done and come back with four more tomorrow to give the whole uh, 17. Turn to Psalm 28. Psalm 28. Jane, I'm going to probably have you come up. I just call you spontaneous. No, I mean, when I get done with this, just uh, you've done that a time or two, and it's just so cool. But I, I like more giving you the one-second notice because you're just kind of, ah! That's fun. But uh, I'm giving you the 10-minute notice, which is uncharacteristic of me. Okay. Psalm 28. Here we are in the May, and this is a story many of you have heard over the years. It's, it's the Solemn Assembly of 1983. It's the 21-day fast we've talked about several times in this testimony. Uh, I mean, in the eight sessions we've given so far. It's the 14th day, so it's Saturday night, May 21st. Saturday night, May 21st. Okay, Bob... Had, uh, the Lord had visited Bob in a dream or whatever and spoke to him. He said, give Mike Psalm 28. Give him Psalm 28 because Psalm 28 is for him. Psalm 28 is for the, the people that, it, that he, uh, he, uh, the Lord has given him leadership over. Psalm 28. So Bob brings me Psalm 28. And I've said this over the years. I, I don't have full meaning of it by any means. It's, I mean, I have like 20... Psalms more uh, important to me, I mean, that seem to touch me more than Psalm 28, but I know this is a real biggie, so I'm going for it. But I just don't have the, uh, the sense of it yet, and it's been uh, 18 years later, 19 years, whatever. Okay, so here it is on Saturday night. Okay, we're, so we got seven days to go on this fast. It's 11.15, because remember, we're going from 6 in the morning to 12 at night for 21 days. It's 11.15 at night. It, I mean, I'm tired. Everybody's tired. I'm bored. The prayer meeting is pathetic. Well, most of them were, just to be honest, just to be, they were really pathetic. Uh, but they were important to God. I mean pathetic in terms of in our natural man, but they were important to God. I tell you, they were. So I, I need to change the word from pathetic to they were oppressive. That's a better word. They were not pathetic because they, they did the work that God wanted them to do. So I, I uh, upgrade that word there. Okay. What happens I read, I say, okay, I got 45 minutes. I'm going to read Psalm 28. I hadn't read it yet. And I said this. It, this was uh, one of those instant travail things I told you about the other day. Because uh, that's happened to me three times in St. Louis. Once in the Easter 83 story I told you. And then the uh, July uh, 88 when I was giving you the uh, John chapter 644. Not that you remember that. But this is the only other time it's happened now. And uh, uh so I, I don't want you to have the idea that just every time you turn around, this happens. But this was a, uh, 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 a story of powerful supernatural travail. It's, you know, at the, so I've given you five or six times it's happened over the years, but we're believing God for it to happen a lot more. I read, I go, to you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. That's all I do. That doesn't seem that, you know, different. <laughs> I'm going to say something respectful. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem like that great of a verse is what I'm trying to say in a nice way. But I, I read that verse, to you, O Lord, I will cry. And when I read it, I'm talking about 1.2 seconds. <laughs> That's, I'm making up that. But one second or, or not much more than one second. The Holy Spirit hit me 
I, I mean, this is the oddest thing you can imagine. I read one line. I can't even read the second line. And I am in full weeping, Holy Spirit groaning travail in one second from a total oppressed, bored, oh, yuck, I hate this fast mood. In one second. I mean, that to me, to this day, drives me crazy how that happened. I'm not crazy. I'm not saying it right. Perplexes me how that happened. And I am. I go to you, oh, Lord, I cry. And I put my head. I have a pillow there, not for anything but sleeping on, just so you know. And, but it's right there. It's convenient. I go, and I'm, and I'm wailing in my face in the pillow. I don't have any comprehension what's happening. And uh, the fire of God hits my stomach, my abdomen. I mean, intense fire. It goes through. I feel the, the, the path of it. It stays in my stomach the whole time for the whole 45 minutes. My hand goes to my hands and my mouth, burning in my hands, burning around my mouth with such Holy Spirit electricity, with so much energy of the Holy Spirit that my body was vibrating, not just on the outside for sure, but on the inside, everything in me was quaking and trembling out of my control. Everything. Now, the, in my hands, not my lips, it was buzzing like electricity because that's Holy Spirit energy. It's not electricity. It's the Holy Spirit. It got so hot in my hands, it began to hurt. I've heard uh, the famous story, D.O. Moody in the streets of Chicago, the Spirit of God came on him. He said, oh, Lord, stay thy hand lest you kill thee or something. I thought, oh, I don't believe it. If the Holy Spirit came on me, I'd say more. I don't care what was going on. I, I never really knew if I fully believed that story, you know, if it's a little exaggerated. I mean, if the Holy Spirit's on, you want more. You don't want him to stop, right? Unless you've got 110 volts and he's a billion volts, then maybe you tell him to stop. My hand was hurting so bad with heat, both hands. It was uh, uh, severe. I didn't say stop, but it, it was hurting. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. So this travail, I'm travailing, and the electricity's going up and down from my abdomen to my hands to my mouth. My hands up and down. I have no grid yet what's happening. Five minutes into this, there's a relief. There's a reprieve. Wow. I take a breath. Wow. The fire is still there. There's no sense of the wind thing that I mentioned once. I read the, I'm going to try to read the rest of verse 1. I get to the next sentence. Do not be silent. Wham! It hits again. Wham! I don't mean the fire. The fire was there the whole time. Duh! And I'm right into the pillow, and I'm quaking my whole body. And I don't even know what the end of verse 1 is yet, you know? And I'm, duh! And I'm buried in the pillow and groaning, groaning in travail for the breaking forth of the power of God. I don't have a clue what I'm praying for except for the power of God. Travailing Holy Spirit intercession. The burning is on my hands so intense. It goes on and on. Five minutes, whatever. It's not like you're timing it. I get up again. I mean, I oh, look, lest you be silent, I became like those go down the pit. Wham! Again, and it goes on to where I make it through most of Psalm 28. I don't know that I ever actually finished it, but I went the whole 45 minutes under the power of God in electricity and groaning, travailing, and uh, buried in the pillow, shaking, quivering. And the Lord makes it clear to me, very clear, I am giving you a token. That's the only thing I know of besides what's in the passage. This is a token of healing power. I get up from this. It's 12 o'clock. There's maybe one or 200 people, whatever, in the room. Everybody's tired, cranky, and we're just tired, you know. I'm walking to the car. I'm walking with Diane. I'm smiling. She goes, what are you so happy about? I said, I'm really happy. She goes, what, you got a little milkshake over there or something? <laughs> I said, no, I'm really, really happy. Because I know it's a spiritual breakthrough. So we go, it's about a 10-minute drive. Three, four minutes. She goes, are you going to tell me? I go, I'm just really happy. <laughs> and I don't mean giddy. Oh, I said, I knew that I knew that I knew that something struck. So we get home. She goes, are you going to tell me? And I said, just in a minute, I am really happy right now. Uh, meaning my spirit is alive, that I've connected with God in our destiny. Not, I didn't have the spirit of joy. I wasn't that kind of happy, I, but that's the word I used. In. And I told her, and, uh, and then I said, Lord, 
I've never had, I've had a few prophetic dreams before this, but I didn't know them. Because in those days, I was so new at it, I had them, but no one in my world ever had them, so I just called them pizza dreams. And in retrospect, in retrospect, they really were prophetic dreams, but I didn't know it. So as I'm sitting there, I'm going to, I've known Bob Jones now for this three, four months, and I just get bold. I said, Lord, give me a dream. Just, we're connected. I'm plugged in. Give me a dream. I, I've never asked for a dream like that ever. I said, tell me directly, face-to-face -face in a dream what you just did. And then I kind of got a little scared in my faith. And I said, and just in case we're not as connected as I'm thinking, give Bob Jones one too, just in case. <laughs> no, I asked for two things. I asked for two things because... Remember, Bob, the day I met him on March 7th, he told me the four visions. There's going to be thousands of young people, the full gifts of the Holy Spirit, a false prophet, da da da, da. Then he tells me a couple days, you know, two weeks later, about the vow I made with my father. He tells me, Gabriel, Daniel chapter 9. You know, he tells me on, on Easter about the travail. I saw you. You were about to cast the net and go fishing. Five or six times he's told me what happened to me. So I said, Lord, it's only natural that I would ask you. I don't want to be dependent on a prophet, but just in case you don't give me one, give one to Bob Jones. A little backup system. That night, I have my first knowing prophetic dream of my life on that night. And the Lord visits me in that dream. I won't tell it. Because it's too long, it just means this. I'm going to release unprecedented power through these people that is knit beyond anything seen in America, ever in America, ever in America. And he tells me this very clear. I'm going to release power through this people. And I know, I know in the dream, it's a phenomena he's doing, I mean, a dynamic he's doing amongst the fasting and praying people all over the earth. I never think it's Kansas City and only Kansas City. I understand that the one who's passionate for me is passionate. He's passionate for every city of the earth. He loves the earth. He loves the earth. And don't ever get narrow-minded and think because he's got a few places where he's starting a little bonfire that he's not absolutely ravished with, with the nations of the earth. Don't ever go there. And so I know we're going to see a breaking through a fourth of power, and many groups in America will see this, but unprecedented. I wake up, because, you know, you got to get up, and because uh, we got to be there at 6 in the morning, so the alarm's up, whatever, and get up, and I'm driving there, and I've got this dream, my first one. I got one. I'm one of those guys now. I had a dream, a real one. And, and because you say, well, maybe you just psychosomatic yourself into it. No, it didn't work. I've tried that a thousand times. I've tried to get that dream. I'm oh, I'm one for a thousand in the last 30 years. I'm trying to get a dream. And I go, I go Lord, this would be a good one. This would be a good night to get it. Zero for a thousand except for this night. So it wasn't, I didn't psychosomatic myself into it. I walk in, but I don't know if Bob does. Okay, 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm there. I, uh, uh, Bob comes at 8.30. Bob comes at 8.30. Oh, I remember it so well. I was up at the front, and he was at the back, uh, coming in the back door. It just so happens I looked up right when he walked up, right, right when he walked in the back door. I caught his eye. Oh, I love it. I caught his eye, and he shook his head. I said, unbelievable. I, but I didn't know for sure, you know. He put his thumb up, he shook his head, and he pointed to the back office. So he walked to it, like to the gym there. And I got up, and I said, oh, Lord Jesus, 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 you know, I did everything. Now I lay me down to sleep. I tried every prayer, everything, Lord. I want this to be the real one. Well, it's already past tense. He already had it or didn't have it. But I was just, I was scared that it maybe wouldn't be, that he's going to say, yep, I saw you. And the Lord says he's calling you to a life of fasting or something. And I didn't know what the dream was going to be. But I thought, I bet it, I just know it's the healing. It's got to be, it's got to be. Because it was so connected. Uh, we were together in the spirit for that uh, season there. And uh, the Lord, I forgot to mention that I had written down, I had it in my hand on, on a uh, uh, notebook. I had written down Matthew 10, 8 and 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Matthew 10, 8, freely give, freely receive. They'll cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead. You know the whole bit. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, you'll do it by grace. I had those two verses, the only two verses I had them written down there. And when I came out of this dream, the Lord told me clearly, not in the dream, but afterwards, these are the two verses. This is it right here. So I had, I had my little notebook, and, uh, and I thought just in case, I better fold the pages. You never know. And so I walk in, and Bob says, he goes, the Lord visited you last night, didn't he? I says, Bob, 
I want to talk so bad I could die, but I, you got to tell me because if I tell you, I will never be sure in 10 years. I go, just tell me everything. And I don't want to say nothing. He says, well, uh, he goes, let me just say it then. The Lord did visit you last night. I go, just, just hurry up. <laughs> and because uh, I don't know, it could be anything. You were called to martyrdom. It could be anything. And I'm listening. He said, the Lord walked up to you, and he had this sash upon himself, and it said, Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee. He took it off, and he put it upon you. He goes, it was a healing anointing last night that you received. And, of course, I knew that last night. Well, I mean, to my little inexperienced knowing, I believed it was a, a healing thing, but the, then the dream made it clear. And he said, the Lord himself put Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee. He put this sash upon you. And then he prophesied to you, and he says, you know he's prophesying to the youth movement that's behind you. He says, it's more than you. You know he's prophesying to many more than you. It's a whole company of people. And he prophesied, here's the Lord said this. Look straight at me. I mean, in Bob's experience, not in mine. He looked straight at me, and Bob said, he looked at you, and he said, uh, uh, Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee. No disease known to man will stand before this people. No disease known to man will stand before this people. And he said, and then he went on and he said, however, you must not get into malpractice. He used med medical terminology, which means you cannot use this for your own glory and your own financial prosperity. Because the verse that God gave me that morning, Matthew 10, 8, freely give, freely receive, I was thinking more of the heal the sick, raise the dead, and the Lord spoke in, uh, to Bob uh, in this whole thing and said, you must freely give and freely receive in the spirit. It doesn't mean that there's never money exchanged, but there's not a group of people, the sinner, uh, 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 getting rich on it. It's funding the whole thing. He said, malpractice is if you touch the realm of the money in an inappropriate way. You cannot do that because this healing power is going to bring the attention of the kings of the earth and they will empty their storehouses into the coffers of the people with this kind of anointing. And Bob said, it must build this youth movement that God's talking about. And he said it must build the house of prayer. It must build God's kingdom because the wealth of the earth is going to be emptied in when the healing anointing happens. He goes, you must freely give it and freely receive it. And again, uh, 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 as me and Bob talked that day, I go, talk to me more. This is so important. He goes, I'm not talking about a little money here, a little money there going back and forth or this or that. He goes, but you can't. He goes, the, the capacity for indescribable wealth will be there. And men have touched the gold when they've touched the anointing. And you cannot do that. And the people with you cannot do it. And he said, the Lord, he says, put your hands out. I put my hands out. He says, Matthew 10, 8. And they said, the Lord told me to tell you one more. He says, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, the exact two verses. I just went, oh, yes, exactly. I mean, Lord, this is amazing. And Bob said, today, he says, you've got to know this. He goes, last night was a token that, that uh, he said, what happened? I told him the 45-minute thing. He said, that 45 minutes was a token for you, but now the Lord wants to give a token for the people today. I said, what do you mean? He said, today he's going to demonstrate a little bit of that power today. Just a little bit of that power. He said, but then after that, it's going to lift. And we, you realize the next week is when the Lord spoke about the spiritual drought. So uh, it came once, and that was just about it in terms of any kind of uh, 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 whatever. Uh, I mean, any, it wasn't regular at all. And so uh, he, I said, today, today? Of course, I think it's the beginning of the end time move of God. And I don't know the next week the spiritual drought word's going to come. I'm just like, yay, I knew it, I knew it. And, uh, oh, I was so excited. I go, well, what do I do? He says, just be, just free. You're going to freely receive it and freely give it. Don't worry. There's nothing you can do. It's all by grace. First Corinthians 15, 10. Just get up and tell the story. Okay. I mean, I should just tell this? He goes, just tell it and then God will release it. So I said, good. Well, that makes it an easy message. And so I got up and gave a little short testimony and whatever. And our church was maybe four or 500 people there. And maybe 100 came up or 200. I don't really know because it went on maybe an hour. I don't really know for sure. It's, it's not like you're timing it. And uh, I remember because every, every now and then, you know, you'd pray for somebody and somebody get touched. Not much, but a little here, a little there. And I just remember the, uh, 
display a, a very little. Now, I'm talking about our relate, rel, relative to what we experience, okay? I'm not talking about relative to what I've just described for the last hour. I, I remember the power of God that were, was hitting people. I remember going up and touching, going up to a couple people on the road like that, getting close to them, and like eight of them all went crashing through the chairs, I didn't even pr touch them. I went up and I said, I just got to pray. I went like that. And the power of God, I don't know if it was eight, but it just the four, five, six, pew! And I went, what was that? And Bob was on the f over there and he's, uh-huh, keep on going. <laughs> keep on going. And I asked him to come up. He goes, you don't need me up there. He goes, it's, it's for you. He goes, I already believe this stuff. <laughs> he goes, it's for you. He goes, it's only a token and it's for them. Because you don't believe and they don't believe. It's for you guys. I don't need to get up there. I said, well, could you help me a little bit? He goes, you don't need my help. It's going to be totally sovereign. And when that happened, I looked at Bob. He goes, keep on going. And then I, I can't remember. I don't, you know, the stories are mixed. You know, whether it's five, uh, I mean, really intense healings or three or 12. I, I don't know because I wasn't one to keep all those records and uh, those kinds of things. I keep records of revelation but not records of the numbers who get touched and stuff. But... I, I know in the wake of it, I know there was one lady, uh, I remember this, it wasn't that morning, but it was like a day or two, I mean, immediately after, I can't remember when, but she uh, was there that morning, and something like she couldn't get prayed for, for something, I can't remember, she goes, can I still get prayed for, something like that, and uh, she was uh, going to have her hysterectomy the next day, and she was instantly healed, and there were a number of instant, instant healings. Because there's the progressive healings, there's the instant healings. But the people that were touched, and some were not touched at all. But in my little experience, that was one of the most powerful days I'd ever witnessed. And, uh, and so Bob afterwards says, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you guys paid attention because it's going to lift. It's only a token. But that's only a down payment of what's coming. Jane, you, now how many of you in the room here were there that morning just for fun? I just want to raise your hand. I want you to stand up just so I can see if you were there. Just I want to see if I got... Who is there? Okay, let me see. Oh, yes, that's true. Oh, that's right. Okay, there's five of you that were there. Six. Back. Oh, there's Becky. That's right. That's right. So, good. I'm just glad to see. And I'm seven, so that's the perfect number. So, there you have it. I just <laughs> made that one up. Okay, Jane, come up and say what, what happened to you. And, and that morning was so powerful to me, not because... The ministry, you know, I'm used to a minus one in power, and that was like a .5. It wasn't like unbelievable, but in my little world, it was pretty intense. And I said, Lord, now I know I believe it. I'll try to tell the short story. <clears throat> well, anyway, just to give you a little background, uh, when I got saved, I was 23, and uh, I went through the worst year of my life. My whole life went like to the bottom of the bucket. And I fell into all kind of sin that I used to brag that I would never fall into because I was Christian. So um, smoking cigarettes, three packs a day, was the least of my problems <laughs> when I started um, at MCF. So I'd been saved about maybe 12 years, maybe more. And cigarettes were really a problem to me. I was a driven, driven cigarette addict. I know a lot of people just quit smoking. You know, that's great, but I wasn't one of those people. I smoked. If I got up in the night, I'd smoke a cigarette. If I um, left the room, I'd go into another room. And, oh, if I left my cigarette, I'd just light another one. I was never without this <laughs> smoking chimney. My chest hurt so badly that when I woke up in the morning, you don't even probably know you do this, but you take a deep breath when you first wake. And my lungs would crack. I could feel this feeling, this pain inside of there. And I think it's because this was filled with nicotine. All I could think about was me and cigarettes, me and cigarettes. I was in the way of praying for the city. So the next morning, I have one cigarette left on my way to church. So I smoke my one cigarette, put it out as I went in the door. And I go in and we're worshiping. People line up all across the front. And I'm like three-fourths of the way down. So I'm a long ways and waiting oh, God, is it really going to happen? So Mike comes up and lays hands on me. And I'm telling you the most astounding thing happened. I, somehow God let me see this. Out of the palms of his hands came lightning bolts, white lightning bolts. They went, and struck me, and I was like, bam, to the floor. 
none of this nice floating down women's aglow stuff at all. It was terrible and powerful. I got up from that floor. I had no pain in my chest. I didn't have a smoker's cough. I didn't have a smoker's voice anymore. I, didn't, I don't think I smelled like smoke. I had no more craving. It was totally gone, absolutely gone. <laughs> I have to add, though, that I had a three-month open heaven after this. So time goes by, and I'm having open heaven visitations. I saw Jesus. I saw demons, strong men, terrifying things, glorious things for three whole months. Mike had a one-day healing anointing as a sign of what's coming when the revival does come. It would be so powerful that I wasn't just delivered, just healed, but also I was kept free through that three months of open heaven that was so astounding, it was the anointing that abided for three months and it lifted. It was glorious. Yes, uh, I forgot to mention that, that one of the things that happens if you, over history, and Bob has seen a pole, seen it, when the anointing is moving like lightning, not that you have to see it, it releases people into uh, visitations and revelations. That's a, uh, I don't want to say common like it happens all the time everywhere, but Bob has uh, prayed for people where they get their healing, and if there's a certain dimension of the Spirit, they begin to move in the realm and see angels, and they, it's an open heaven. It's, it's really true. That's part of the lightning striking. When the people get healed, they get more than healed. They get ushered into a new realm for a season. And so that's where this thing is going called the end time church. Let's stand. It really is true. This is where it's going. 